Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Holistic Pharmacy Podcast. I have a very dear friend here and a guest on this episode. It's Cheryl Passwater. She's wearing many hats, including the one she's actually got on. She's a functional medicine practitioner, master fermentationist, and health coach. So welcome to the show, Cheryl. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we met online in my holistic pharmacist group, and we've been following each other's work ever since. We had a Facebook Live. We talked about post-COVID and other things. Um, And uh, you lived for a long time in Brooklyn, which is where I live. So tell us a little bit about, you know, where you hail from um, and a little (laughs) bit about your journey into functional medicine. Um, Sure. So, again, my name is Cheryl Passwater. Um, Yeah, I I guess originally hail from the harvest land state of Indiana, (laughs) Um, but I lived in New York City and Brooklyn for 16 years. Um, I actually um, ended up there for graduate school. I have a master's degree in art history and also MFA in painting. Um, So I have a background in the art world. Um, And then I currently hail from Atlanta, Georgia, (laughs) or live in Atlanta, Georgia. That's great. So um, how did your background influence the journey that you took into your profession and, you know, changing your career paths or integrating different things into it along the way, like, you know, growing up in Indiana and what made you to move to New York City and eventually now reside in Atlanta, if you can maybe talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um, So I moved to New York City um, originally to be an artist. (laughs) Um, I was already working in the art world. Um, When I left undergrad, I was working as an artist, um, working in arts education as well. Um, And then my late 20s decided to go to graduate school. So I ended up at the Pratt Institute um, and went through my dual master's degree programs. And I was working and TAing and interning. And um, that's a lot of stuff to do over over a three year period. um, And just in general, and I had always had like problems with like colds. And, you know, I had shingles in my early 20s, like lots of things that were kind of creeping up that were like immune system, um, you know, maybe a little bit on fire. And I just, you know, didn't know any better at the time. I um, didn't grow up in holistic medicine world. I, um, you know, didn't really, you know, know any better, do any other things. Um, but when I left graduate school, um, it was like, I walked across the stage of graduation and my body just gave out. And I had kind of constantly been sick, um, lots of ear infections and asthma and bronchitis and just so much respiratory, um, distress. And I just kind of felt like I was always sick. Um, but I left grad school and about six months later, it was just like, I was greenish, the gray, greenish gray, like Kermit the frog. Um, I just always felt like crap. Um, I was having asthma attacks almost weekly at that point, going to the, you know, emergency room, going to Bellevue, going to this, going to that, you know, and I'd go to doctors and they'd be like, oh, well, you just need antibiotics. And the antibiotic, you know, (laughs) hamster wheel, just multiple rounds of antibiotics, or you need more steroids, Um, you know, or, you know, we can, you know, just not really getting anywhere. It just kind of felt like band-aids and nobody was really doing anything for me. And I actually woke up in the middle of the night one night. It was the night before my um, 30th birthday. And I woke up and some, I was having an asthma pa- attack, but I swear it was the universe. It was like a divine intervention. It was like, you're going to die if you don't do something drastic. Um, so I actually ended up going, selling all my music gear. Um, so I used to play in a bunch of bands. I walked down to a pawn shop. I sold all my music gear. I walked into a, a holistic practitioner acupuncturist office who I had talked to like the week before. And I was just like, I don't know how I could ever afford this person. And I walked in, I put a water cash on her table and I was like, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'm going to die. <laughs> I will, tr- I will do anything. I had been a vegetarian for 15 years. I was like, I will eat meat. I was prepared <laughs> to do that. Like, I was just like, I cannot keep going like this. Like I was, you know, sleeping 12 hours a day and going to work and coming home and taking like a three hour nap. So I was sleeping like 15 hours a day. It was just like, I was always either asleep 
or laying around with no energy. And I just felt cruddy. So I started changing my diet and um, making some big changes. I worked with her for about a year and my immune system was just finally starting to really recover quite a bit. And then um, I decided to do a candida cleanse for like a year. And I was just like, okay, so it's no sugar, it's no alcohol, low sugar fruit and eat real food like supplements. I was like, I can do this. And I was so dirt poor. Um, I had all these hospital bills. In fact, I spent that about six months of that year, completely homeless out of housing, paying off my medical bills and like crashing with friends, subletting, staying wherever I needed to do. But I stayed on that freaking candida cleanse. And at the end of the year, I healed my asthma. I never had another asthma attack. And I was just like this, like really mind blowing thing of like, crap, we can heal ourselves. Like if you really want it, you can do it. And it was both mental game and like the physical game and other, um, fast forward a little bit further, maybe a year later. Um, I was just reading like a lot of Sally Fallon and Michael Pollan and the China studies, just like all these books. I was just constantly going to the library, checking out books and again, still dirt poor, <laughs> stinky New York city summer, you know, just completely, um, you know, sweaty balls, riding your bike everywhere. And, um, the person I was subletting my apartment from had left her kombucha scoby behind. And she was like, you know, just ferment something if you want to. And I was just like, and I remember reading this book one night, cause I've been reading about fermentation here and there, but this is kind of before like fermentation became a buzzword. Um, this is before I knew who Sandra Katz was. This is before a lot of things. And I was staring at this kombucha scoby one night and it just like occurred to me that every culture in the world eats fermented food, but us, but we're the sickest. And I was, um, mentally, <laughs> it was like, wow. And then, um, it's just as somebody who likes making stuff and process. And I think just my artist brain, I was like, okay. So I started making kombucha. I was making too much. I started making sauerkraut and other things. And, um, I was giving to friends and the next thing I knew I was selling to friends. And the next thing I knew I had started this rogue mafia style fermentation CSA in Brooklyn. Um, and so I had it in the back of a CSA for a while and a coffee shop. Eventually I had a refrigerator locked up in an alley behind my friend's bar. You would get the code, put, get your ferments, put your cash in the jar, lock it back up, <laughs> walk back out. Um, and I may saved up enough money to go back to school to study fermentation, um, some herbalism, a little this, a little that, some health coaching stuff. And then um, I contraband ferments was sort of born out of that whole thing. So, um, and I was still working on my own healing, you know, at the time and my own stuff and feeling like, am I ever going to get to the root cause? Like, am I going to find like the real, why am I always like, and I was always this thing where I was like, I was so radically better, but I could never quite get over, get over the edge. And later on, um, I found out mold toxicity and some other things were, um, have been a big part of my lifelong um, journey and, you know, mission to reclaim my own immune system. Um, but yeah, so contraband ferments happen. I started randomly teaching. I got asked to teach a couple workshops and I thought, Oh, this will be fun. I'll practice whatever. And then that kind of blew up and I was teaching about 250 in-person workshops, um, leading up to the pandemic. And then, um, I finally decided to go back to functional medicine school really because, I'm tired of seeing people push through the system. Um, and I was spending 30 to 60 minutes at the end of every fermentation workshop, you know, helping people try to deal with their own gut stuff or find good practitioners or just being, again, pushed around the same way I had kind of put, been pushed around. And I was like, well, when you see stuff like that, you've been through it yourself, you either do something or you sit on your hands and I'm going to do something kind of lady. So that's the long version of the short version. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, thank you so much for painting that vivid picture for us. I mean, I could really see that you are an artist just as much as with your words as with other mediums, potentially. Um, and you're speaking into so many things that we talk about on this podcast, which is really like how acute care does have an amazing role. But when you're getting the same exact back and forth in and outside of the hospital rotating door, like something yeah. else is going on. And we can't just keep giving a Band-Aid or an antibiotic when 
you know, it's just so consistent and so persistent. And, uh, you know, functional medicine, it has really coined its term and in, in getting down to the root. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to my herbal teacher, uh, Vanessa Chakur, for writing Awakening Artemis. And she talks about having asthma and other things, too, that she was able to heal with plants and plant medicine. And it's not just about like ingesting a plant instead of ingesting a drug or anything like that. It's really about what you're describing, like a healing journey and and get, getting down to layers and working with multiple practitioners to get down to that. What And it's usually not just one root cause, right? We always talk about that. There's multiple yeah. factors, there's internal and external things contributing to it. And like you said, the mind-body connection of like, having that perseverance and that will to even make these changes to what we're putting inside our body and having access to those things too with our budgets and you know you touched on so many important points that people encounter on their healing journeys and sometimes it's not just going to be like okay i go to the practitioner and they're my savior it, there's just you know you, you might have to work with somebody who teaches you and motivates you as a coach somebody else who maybe runs a test on you, you know, somebody else that maybe helps you more with like a body connection or actually moves your physical body in certain ways. Like I know you like the chiropractor. We talked about that. So it, it's not that there's this one savior out there, right. And everybody has to go to that savior. It's that we are, like you said, our own savior, our own healer. And there's sometimes just multiple levels to it that we have to unravel. Yeah. That you 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 nailed you nailed it. I nailed <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> you nailed it. Well, I always say you know it's like we have many teachers, right? Also through life, and so um, you know I was recently at my acupuncturist um, office, and um, he has this shelf kind of tucked up in the corner of his office, and he's got all these little photos and frames of his teachers, just the people who have taught him and taught him well and transformed him both as a person, as a practitioner. And I was like, I remember like being like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to do that in my own office. <laughs> I was like, I love that. Right. It's like, it's a little bit of homage and it's remembering like your roots and where you've come from and the people who have helped you and the, the people who have taught you and, you know, healing is so um, multi-layered, you know, there are things that 20 years ago I would have never been open to that I'm open to now. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's so true of the herbal lineages as well, where we are taught, we're like descendants of different herbal traditions and teachers. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like go to university, get this degree, sign it by the dean or, you know, by this uh, person who handles licensure. It's it's mm -hmm. much more personal and healing is personal. It's a personal journey. And like you also said, you have to be open and willing to make those changes. And that's such a key component, which is why it does take, you know, they say that it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes, you know, a lot of community. Um, and that's also a missing piece, I think, is like COVID was showing us, isolating our, each other and ostracizing each other and dividing each other is counterproductive, you know? So if we study like loneliness as a contributing factor to mortality and morbidity with cardiac disease, which is what was at the root with a lot of issues, even with COVID or without COVID, it's still the leading cause of death and it just yeah. compounded with all these other things. So I love that you said about that culture, right? Cultures, cultures, culture, right? Essentially all cultures, culture, food. So um, I want to talk a little bit about your fermentation journey and gut health. And if you could just also speak to um, the candida diet as well, because there's some controversy about kombucha or other sort, sorts of um, fermentation, including with dairy. So can you bust some myths for us here? <laughs> um, sure. So um, let's talk about candida, <laughs> I guess. So, um, and it's funny, I just did an Instagram live earlier today with my friend, Jessica at, um, full circle wellness. And I was talking about this a little bit, but I was like, you know, nothing lives in a vacuum, <laughs> like nothing. There's not any one medicine that's necessarily going to work. Everybody's bodies are different. What works for you isn't necessarily going to work for me. And I think fermentation is the same way. I think a lot of people think like fermentation is a cure-all and I'm like, this is powerful medicine, but it, it isn't a cure-all. And while 
in theory, our bodies are meant to be able to tolerate, handle, accept fermented foods on a regular basis. That's why our ancestors always use them. Um, we unfortunately live in a world full of um, toxins and chemicals and exposures and fluoride and chemtrails and the stuff we put on our skins, you know, estrogens, all kinds of things. And um, those all interfere with our gut and our gut's ability to handle fermented food. Um, but there's like, you know, I like to put fermented foods sort of in categories. And I think this is a good way of explaining it. So there are foods that are fermented that are, you know, what are called lacto fermentation, lactic acid um, fermentation. And those are things that are more like vegetables. So I would say, you know, sauerkraut or kimchi or pickles, stuff like that. Bacteria is like the kind of main vein or category, um, you know, of those foods. You know, there are other ferments that are more yeast based. So if you think sourdough bread, you think um, vinegar is another really good one. Like yeast is their, <laughs> their thriving most notable thing. They're like, that's their kind of category. And then we have ferments that are mold based. So if you're thinking, you know, miso and amazake, koji, um, you know, et cetera, those things all tempeh, those things all sort of are in their own zone. And then there are some ferments that can cross in between um, things. And so when we're talking about something like candida, which is, you know, a systematic yeast overgrowth, um, you know, it's, it's tricky because some people would say candida, no fermented foods. Some people would say candida, maybe only certain things. And, um, you know, I, I tend to depending on the level of candida and tending on, um, pending on how well that person can clear histamine in general, um, sort of, you know, shifts how I decide to guide somebody, I guess. Um, but you know, with candida, I would say for, a chunk of people. And I'm not going to say all people, because again, nothing is always in, is always black and white. Um, you know, I, you know, a lot of times like a little bit of fermented vegetables, a little bit of dairy kefir can be, um, really helpful for people while they're going through clearing that candida, um, a little bit of yogurt. Um, but then there are some people they can't handle it. Now the case of kombucha, because kombucha likes to live in that bacteria and yeast space. It is both. I don't usually recommend kombucha as actually a ferment for people who are dealing with candida. It's just not the best thing necessarily for their bodies, but also we're not intended to be in taking so much fermented stuff. These big bottles of kombucha that they're selling, that's way more kombucha than what we should be drinking in any one sitting. I had another health coach who came to me a couple of years ago and she was like, Hey, I have this client. We've been bringing in some ferments, but her reactions are getting worse. I just can't figure out what's going on. And I was like, well, what ferments? And she's like some fermented vegetables. And I'm like, okay. And I was like, what else? She's like, well, some kombucha. And I was like, how much kombucha is she drinking? And she was drinking, you know, two, three bottles of kombucha a day and couldn't figure out why she was getting migraines and having all these histamine reactions <laughs> and all this stuff. And I was like, A, she can't tolerate histamine very well. And B, you know, she's drinking way too much. Kombucha is not the drink for her right now. And that doesn't mean that at some point those foods might not come back in. Um, but sometimes we need a break from them. You know, I, I'm recovering from mold toxicity still. I'm a mold exposure after a building fire um, four years ago. And that wiped out my microbiome um, pretty severely too. And like, I just took a year and a half off eating fermented food because I needed to heal my body more and my body couldn't tolerate them, which was devastating when you work in the world of fermentation and you contribute to books and you teach and all this stuff. But I also try to practice what I preach best I can. And, you know, it, and that's real, like and my body just couldn't tolerate them. Yeah. Could you speak to like SIBO or histamine intolerance and how you would know that you're not tolerating fermented foods? Yeah. So histamine intolerance, um, you know, some people have genetic markers where they just don't clear histamine well. Some people, um, their guts are a wreck. And because of that, they're not making enough DAO or HNMNT um, enzymes to clear histamine. Um, there's some other nuances to it, but in general. Um, so, um, crap, I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. What was the question no, again? It's okay. So how would you even know that you're just not tolerating yeah histamine foods or fermented foods. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, things like runny nose, 
post-nasal drip, maybe you get stuffy, um, stuff like hives or even like skin stuff that starts, you know, itchy skin, um, things like that, um, can be signs of histamine intolerance. Um, somebody who just generally gets like really bad seasonal allergies is also like a really good marker. If you know, you're somebody who you go through a couple seasons a year and you're just like snotty, runny, crusty, the whole deal. Um, you know, even like a lot of like clearing of the throat that like post nasal drip, things of that nature, um, are sort of big markers for that histamine and things that we want to look out for. Um, again, you know, and I don't, you know, I tell everybody like, don't just go all in and start eating like a quart of sauerkraut or whatever, you know, fermented stuff. If you're not used to eating those foods either. Yeah, I agree. It's always like start low, go slow. It's just a really smart thing for anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I also think the throat clearing could be a sign of um, reflux, which could actually be because of low stomach acid, contrary mm-hmm. to popular thinking. Um, so what is your stance on supporting the microbiome? Is it better to eat, let's say, fermented foods if you can tolerate them? Or what's your stance on probiotics and prebiotics as supplements? Right. Um, so, I mean, I'm a huge fan of good probiotics that are also targeted probiotics. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are actually no regulations in the United States on probiotics, <laughs> um, which is problematic. Um, not that I'm a big fan of regulation in general, clearly as I have a company called contraband ferments, but, and, um, you know, not everything is made the same. Um, now I, I tend to like more spore-based probiotics. I tend to like having options, um, that are maybe, things that are not going to trigger histamine. And it really just depends on the individual. Again, we, we all have different varieties of biodiversity. Our guts have all been exposed to various things. You know, my need again is not necessarily going to be your need or something else. Um, you know, I have a long history of antibiotic abuse <laughs> really is what it is. You know, whether I, I didn't know better at the time, but like, great, you're sick, you take an antibiotic you're sick, you take an antibiotic, you know? Um, and so, you know, having things that are targeted, um, can be really important because again, we don't want to pour gasoline on the fire. Now, when I first got into microbes and fermenting, it was like, great, fermented food is good for everybody. Right. Um, but that's, again, we just learned where that's not really necessarily the case. Um, and it really depends on the state of that person's gut, you know, and like real talk, we are mostly microbes. Like we're more microbial than we are human. Our, our microbes, our DNA, the microbes talk to our DNA. It talks back, um, you know, our mitochondria, our life's energy force that is bacteria. You know, I would tell like, I'm like the Krebs cycle, it's just fermentation, (laughs) you know, like when you break it down, it's the same idea. Like we are meant to be in microbial flux, but unfortunately we have a lot of antibiotic resistance and we have a lot of um, lack of exposure, right? There's lots of things going on. So it's like, you know, we live in this over sanitized world and it also affects what we have in our guts, what is living in our bodies and also what we can tolerate later on, you know, somebody who I know their gut microbiome is zapped out me going and throwing a ton of microbes at them. Isn't exactly (laughs) the best strategy, right? I need to think slow and low about, um, you know, what, what does this person need right now? What do I know about this person's body? What do I know about my own body? Um, you know, that I can't just go do whatever. And there are things, I know you mentioned SIBO a little bit ago, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, you know, even things like SIBO and C. diff, there are things where it's like, if you just go throw microbes, bacteria at those things, you can make the condition worse. Um, you know, that's where those targeted probiotics really come into place. People with cancer, um, really similar idea. Um, so, you know, it's, I think important to work with practitioners. I think, especially if you have things going on and if your gut is in a good state and you're in a overall good state of vitality and health, um, odds are, you're probably going to fare pretty well with fermented foods. Odds are, um, but you know, I see people all the time. They're like, I'm super healthy, but why am I having all these reactions to ferments? And it's either like, they're just doing way too much or, um, their bodies aren't used to the amount of bacteria and microbes they're throwing at it. Um, or, you know, or other. 
And I think just one other thing to add though, too, to that is, um, you know, if you're taking a good high quality probiotic, um, and you're doing fermented food for some people that works for some people that doesn't, you know? So again, no black or white answers. Um, I think everything is very grayscale and all the colors of the rainbow kind of like Skittles, except for I don't eat Skittles, titanium dioxide and all, but you know, <laughs> so yeah. So just some things to think about. Um, and I'm a fan of prebiotics. They are the food, they're the fuel for probiotics. Yeah. I love the hashtag real talk. I'm going to start using that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think another issue that a lot of people are confused about is dairy intolerance and whether fermented dairy is okay for some people, because I mean, it's like 99 point something lactose free and the milk proteins are also pretty broken down. So, uh, what's your stance on that? Um, I'm a big fan of fermenting dairy. In fact, I think the reason we have dairy is probably too fermented. <laughs> if we, you know, we want to look at it that way. Um, it is, I mean, look, I mean, the whole point of fermentation is both preservation to get us through the seasons, but it's biodiversity, it's pre-digestion, it's making our food, um, more digestible. So, I mean, there's a reason our ancestors made yogurt and kefir and cheese and lebna and all these other, you know, kinds of ferments, um, you know, is really, um, important. And part of that is because those microbes eat away at the sugars that are in that food also. So we're eating up, not just the lactose, we're like, you know, we're actually making it better for us. We're not just shooting, you know, even shooting up our sugars by just doing a bunch of milk. Um, and I'm a big fan of like the raw milk world, as much as possible. I'm not a big fan of pasteurization and stuff like that. Um, but we're not intended to be drinking all this milk from other mammals that is not produced. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what are we, what are we doing? So to me, it makes total sense to use the process of fermentation to break down that food, to make it more bioavailable, to make it more digestible. Um, you know, and then again, microbes and biodiversity, um, Plus you're getting the microbiome, you know, the microbes and the diversity from those animals along with the soil and the ground and what they're eating. It's pretty magical. Yeah, absolutely. And I think cheese is a huge food group that most people don't want to give up if they are, you know, told like you need to eliminate dairy. Um, so what's, what have you seen, you know, in the fermentation world and from the perspective of like casein intolerance as which cheeses are maybe better than others if somebody is intolerant? Yeah. Um, I think it depends on the person and their level of tolerance. Now, um, I'm somebody, I don't have a dairy thing per se. I don't do great on tons of dairy, but if I'm eating more like fermented dairy, yogurt, kefir, um, making my own cheeses, um, in particular, um, or just sticking with more like raw cheeses, I'm great when I start eating a lot of the other stuff, that's all kind of junky and pasteurized and whatever. I personally don't do well. Um, now I'll use the example. My wife, um, is actually has a sensitivity to dairy and casing and does not do well on dairy. Um, and I, you know, I would say in her case, like some of those, you know, sticking with some of the dairy, that's more like goat, goat or sheep, um, even camel team seems to be a little bit better, but, um, you know, for again, where she's at at this point in her healing journey, dairy is just not for her. And, you know, and so, um, you know, I like making fermented vegan cheeses and leveling up when I'm doing. Um, and so that's something that, you know, I do in my own home as a class I teach as well, um, is teaching people how to use nuts and seeds and things to, um, make, fermented vegan cheeses so that they're digested um, and the lectins are freed up and, you know, we're actually getting nutritional value out of them instead of, um, you know, all this stuff with fillers and all this extra, um, you know, stuff on the market, which it's like, it's nice if you don't eat dairy, I guess, but what are you eating? I mean, I don't want to eat emulsifiers. I'm pre pretty sure other people hopefully feel the same way. Maybe they just don't realize they're eating them, but um yeah. So, you know, I don't think it's a, again, black or white answer, but 
Yeah. And I appreciate your commentary even earlier about, you know, being vegan or being vegetarian. And a lot of people do it for health reasons or for environmentalist reasons. And sometimes that's not the best thing. And, you know, you really have to look at your ingredients and be aware about lectins and quality, you know, and I adopted a vegan diet too, at some point, and I was eating tons of seeds and oils and things like that and nuts. Yeah. And that was even, that was probably the worst thing I could have done. Yeah. Right. And, and it wreaked havoc on my skin and, and, um, made my PCOS worse. So um, anyway, I would love to also ask you about, you know, where you start with people, right? I mean, understanding there's so many factors that are environmental ingredients that we're eating, um, our mental, right, and inner state of mind. Um, so what's, what's like a place you like to start with clients? <laughs> I throw <thorough> health history. <laughs> like I, I, I truly throw one. Um, you know, I, in my practice, we start with the health, of, health of your mother and go through your entire life. And I think that's important for all of us to be doing. Um, you know, things get missed. We all have histories. Um, and you know, they're the things we chose to participate in, in our lives or things that we did not choose to participate in our lives. Right. Because we were kids, you know, you were fed what you were fed. You were, you know, vaccinated with whatever you were vaccinated with, you know, you were this and that and the other. Um, and, you know, I really try to just go backwards and, you know, it's like, I tell everybody, I'm like, nothing is always again, like pro or anti this or this black or white. It's, is this a toxic exposure? Let's just look at it. It can't hurt to look at, you know, things. And that includes your dental history. Do you have hardware or breast implants? Um, you know, were you bit by a tick and maybe your tick test came up negative, but you can, you know, might still have Lyme going on or, you know, revolving Epstein bar. That's a big one that I've been, um, just consistently seeing like people are like, Oh yeah, I had mono that once. And they think that's it and it's over. And it's like, but you're sort of a forever carrier of something that can lie dormant until it doesn't. Right. Um, and there's you know, lots of things to look at. So I just try to get really deep into people's stories, um, who they are, what brought them to begin with, you know, like, why are you actually here? Um, you know, what is it that I, I can do for you, but also like that their intuition is 50, 50 part of this relationship and it's a relationship and, um, that they're the ones who live in their bodies day to day. So they're the ones who know what's going on, you know? And it's like, my job is to see and be a great detective. But at the end of the day, like it's, it's them. They know what, they know what's happening when they make time to um, look inward. And so I really encourage people to do that when they're doing their intake forms and stuff to like make space. I love that. That's such an important point and not many, unfortunately, practitioners, start there. So I love that you mentioned that. And do you have any tools that you use in order to encourage them uh, to get more in touch with their intuition? Um, I, sometimes I will tell people like, you know, go back and talk with your parents, you know, like this isn't a pointing fingers convers like thing. It's a, do you remember anything? Is there anything that comes up that you maybe thought, Oh, this wasn't a big deal when it happened. And then it turns out, oh yeah, that is a big deal. You know, it's like, I, you know, I can think of a couple of things in my own childhood. I can think about my art studio, in my early twenties that totally had water damage and I didn't know any better. And I was like working and living in a space with mold. Um, you know, there's like, there's things and they're just things that we forget. You know, people think their gallbladders are not important and they're not there. And it's like, no, you actually, you did need that. And we need to replace what's missing because it's not there. So I just, you know, I encourage people to go deeper. And then usually when I get their initial intake stuff and I go through it, if I have areas where I feel like whether it's intuitively something's telling me to go there or whether it is something they've said isn't, you know, or just checked off a series of things, I may ask them to go back and do some deeper digging. Um, you know, and like trauma is part of that, you know, even on my own intakes, it's like, we have trauma stuff, we have, 
you know, parasites, mold, Lyme. We have, you know, vaccination history. We have exposure to other chemicals. You know, it's like, I was an artist. I worked in printmaking shops for years. Like that's really toxic. Um, so, you know, I try to just really be as thorough as I can. And it's like, where are we not looking and where have other people looked to, and where are the, where are the stones that we have not unturned? Like that's, that's both your job and my job. And, you know, I encourage everybody, I'm like, meditate, pray if that's your thing, journal, like sit in nature, just take time to reflect because things will come up when we make space for them to come up. When we ask, you know, the universe, higher power, how nature, however you see it to um, unearth things or like unlayer them, it will. Yeah. I love that. You know, I think there's a saying about attention or intention, but wherever you place your attention, that's what grows and yeah. sort of like inviting that and creating that space, like you said. So I love that. And in Ayurveda, we have the that ether. And that's what I think of as well. And you and I have talked to before about kinesiology. Are you open to sharing about that? I mean, yeah, we can talk about it. Totally. Yeah. So can you just tell people what that is who may not be familiar (laughs) and how you've been using it? Um, well, I'm an, I'm a newbie, newbie in the, in the world of uh, muscle testing. So I'm probably not the best person to explain it just to be, you know, fair, but, um, muscle testing really is just, you know, the, the philosophy that the body doesn't lie, um, that through a series of asking questions, um, we can find imbalances in the body. Now that might be nutritional imbalances. Um, you know, that might be, you know, things like testing for, um, you know, chemicals or, you know, various things. This is like a muscle testing kit, um, here at my desk. Um, and it's about not just asking questions, but asking the right questions, um, and sort of asking things in the right order. And, you know, we can even, you know, test against things like supplements. You know, if I hand you a B complex and a different kind of B complex, you know, your body might like one more than the other. And, you know, we check, there's a lot of ways of checking. Usually you'll see it like somebody will be pressing on somebody's arm. You know, you're not being the incredible Hulk. You know, we're not spider manning somebody's arm down. That's not the goal. But that through gentle, um, basically the body will react through gentle pressure um, and give us answers. You can test for dosages of things. Um, you know, you can test against foods. You can do all kinds of stuff. It's it's an amazing practice. I've only done one level of it. I'm doing um, actually my level two and level three muscle testing in September, but um, so I'm getting more and more experience. Some people will do with things like pendulums. Um, but again, I think, you know, going back to this thing of it's energetic space. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting to play that way with the body. And again, it's almost like giving your body permission to speak. Like sometimes when you're so in your head, right. And you just don't know, and you don't know what the answer is. And you just say, I don't know. And you get so frustrated. And this is just a way to really speak to your body where you don't have that mental block or interference running. And like you said, you know, the body has a lot to share too. And it's, to me, like gentle is powerful. So it's a gentle invitation for your body to speak. And eventually you might have less and less of that interference and you might be able to, um, you know, come up with that answer in your mind and not just in the body. So it's like reestablishing the body body and mind connection. Um, And that safety, I think the creation of feeling safe enough, because often we don't feel safe to speak the answer right? Which is why we have, we create a block around it. So, um, so I love that you're adding that in. And um, it seems like a lot of people have to like play catch up, right? And damage control, because there are, you know, just so many things that we're exposed to, unfortunately, and, you know, we have to kind of just go backwards for collateral damage. And what would be like your advice for somebody to, number one, look, you know, retrospectively, right? And and what is the biggest thing they should look out for? And number two, if like, you could proactively prevent some of these things, what would your advice be on that? Okay. Um, I mean, I tell everybody, I'm like, I, you know, 
I sound like a crazy person sometimes with like the toxin talk, but I'm like, it is a real thing, you know, and I, I know I'm, I'm highly concerned for kids, um, especially in the amount of um, stuff they're being bombarded with. And I think we're not, sometimes I think we're just focused in the wrong places. I think it's really easy to be like, oh, well, everything is this and everything is that. And I'm like, there are a lot of things happening, you know, factory farming and glyphosate, Um, being high on that list, um, which also stays in the body for seven generations. It's Roundup. Um, You know, why is that in our food? You know, why is that being, you know, sprayed on us? Um, So I think we're everybody, it's like, we, we need to best we can mitigate our toxic exposure. And it's like, you cannot hide from all the toxins in the world. Um, You know, I think there's like some real like balancing things like great at home, this is how we live our lives. You know, whatever it is, if your household is, you know, gluten-free or, you know, low, low grain, or, um, you know, you're avoiding food dyes, you know, various other, you know, chemicals and things, um, you know, we, we should be doing that, but also that, you know, we are meant to be detoxing every major culture, religion, other in the world, they are, they are using detox um, in some way or another. And we've gotten away from that. It's like, we've gotten into these like extreme things. Like, and I'm like, okay, if your first time fasting is a 50 day water fast, it's only going to go bad. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like, it's going to go upside down. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think it's a different set of mindfulness and it's also our day-to-day living. We have now become a culture where between chemtrails, between the crap in our water, even if you're filtering your water, the stuff that's coming through water, the amount of antibiotics and birth control and all this junk that we're finding all over the place. And it's on our food. Even when you try to eat organic, your organic food is still not all the way organic. Um, so we, we are at a, I think a, um, a place of no return a little bit where it's like, we have all got to start thinking about like, um, you know, sort of mitigating what's coming in and making sure we are detoxing on the regular. Yeah, really great points here. And to close us out, I would love to know, reflecting back on your journey, right, your healing journey, was there anything that you feel like made the biggest impact or anything that you would have done differently or done sooner? Mm. I wish that anybody had tested me for mold 20 years sooner than they did. Um, I mean, that's a big one. Um, you know, and being mold proficient, which is also very different thing. Um, and I think, you know, too, I wish I had been more open to deeper energetic medicine earlier. I, you know, I was like, things creep, you know, progressively. I don't think it's a regret. But it's something where I'm like, man, if I had just been more open to quantum medicine, if I had just been more open to, you know, biofield tuning and, you know, all this other stuff, just like a little bit earlier, man, that would have been so cool. Um, you know, but I also, you know, like our stories are powerful, however they happen. So I don't regret anything. I just, you know, it would have been nice to have gotten over mold <laughs> a lot earlier than I did. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, well, I love that perspective. And, you know, it reminds me of my own journey and what I hear from people. It's like, you have to be that, you know, the readiness component has to be there or it won't work. And that's like the placebo slash nocebo effect and the intention and attention thing that I mentioned where, you know, if you're going to be closed off to something, then it probably won't work for you because your mind is that powerful. So whatever you believe becomes true in one way or another. And once you are open to it, then there's that potential um, that that you're opening to. So I would love to do a rapid round, fire round with you. um, If you have just one more minute left. Okay, hit me. Great. (laughs) All right. So what's the number one thing? you know, your number one advice for people who want to improve their quality of life right now? Just start making changes. Like if you try to do everything overnight, it will not happen. Like just pick one or two things, focus on them, make them steady habits in your life. 
then pick a couple more things, do it piece by piece. Okay. Awesome. So number two, just for fun, is there anything that you didn't talk about in the episode that is just a fun fact or something surprising about you? Oh boy. Uh, fun facts. She has something surprising about me. I don't know. I feel like I'm always a surprise. I feel like I surprise myself. Um, I detest the color purple. My virtual assistant just recently found this out. She did some mock-up stuff for me and had purple all over it. I was like, never use this color ever again. (laughs) (laughs) We have the same virtual assistant. So I (laughs) I was like, so something you should know about me. I was like, I, you will never see me wear purple. You will not see purple in my home. Cheryl does not do purple. I know. (laughs) <laughs> all right. All right. Um, I love purple. I'll be defending my color. <laughs> Girl, you own it. If it's your jam, I'm like, great. I love other people in purple. It's just not my jam. All right. All right. Um, last fun question. What's your favorite meal to prepare and to consume? And I'm assuming it's fermented, but let's see. Hmm. My favorite meal? <laughs> I mean, I used to live in Italy. I'm a sucker for anything Italian, you know? So I will say I like feeding people in general. It doesn't matter what it is, but I, I do make a pretty mean Italian spread, all gluten-free, um, make a really good eggplant parm. Mm. I'll eat purple food. So food is go. that good that. <laughs> antioxidant polyphenol <laughs> content. I love it. Um, so Olives, olives are my favorite, probably some of the best mm. things that I like from Spain and Italy. But um, mm. all right. So last question for you, Cheryl, this is really hard. How can people get in touch with you, learn more and support your work? It's so hard. I'm, I'm a, just a mystery. You'll have to find me. I'm um, no, just kidding. Uh, you can find me at Cheryl Passwater Functional Med.com at Contraband for Um, I also co host a podcast called Peeling the Onion Podcast. So you can find me at Peeling the Onion Podcast.com. I'm on Instagram and Facebook and all the things. Um, and what else can I tell you? I'm a heel here, there, and everywhere. So follow us. Stay tuned for more. Love it. Love it. And I'm excited to be a guest in your upcoming podcast as well. So I will have all that info in the show notes. And thank you again, Cheryl, for joining me here and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye.